So, today I'm talking, going to talk about going serverless. So there's a lot of hype lately um, about serverless. You might have heard of like, it's the new hottest buzzword, right? Like, people are always talking about like, hey, serverless is all the rage, and you need to be using serverless, and you need to be using Lambda. And uh, so today I think it'd be good to talk about like, well, there's a little bit more than like what seems like a lot of hype there. I mean, I know myself when I hear about like this whole serverless thing, about how you don't need like operations anymore, and so I'm like, oh, it's just a fad. It's gonna be the flash in the pan, no big deal. So my perspective here is uh, we actually use Lambda quite a bit as I fear. We actually started using it back before, like right when it first came out, and I uh, still use it pretty heavily. So what I'm gonna talk about today is just kind of like kind of like what we learned going from there. And then talking about functions as a service, which are uh, basically just have functions get executed in response to different events. First, you know, like deploying an application, running a server, and then having that like handle events, handle HTTP processing. And uh, I'll also touch briefly what I call backend as a service, which backend as a service is a little bit more. Like you have functions as a service, but then you have like services out there now like Firebase that provide like almost an entire backend for you and makes it like really really simple to quickly build and prototype applications. So uh, what I'm going to focus on today though is like you know basically, basically what's all the hype around serverless architecture and then also pretty much focus on Node.js and then this, this, these slides are actually a bit dated but uh, although I'll touch on AWS Lambda in the slides my demonstration is actually going to be using Google Cloud Functions because uh, for, for me at work, we started with AWS, and now we're starting to experiment with Google Cloud because it's like proven to be a bit cheaper, and there's like a lot of interesting advantages there. And then finally, I'll just talk about the advantages and disadvantages. So uh, basically, just give a general understanding of serverless architecture, uh, Node.js, AWS Lambda, and the serverless framework and the value they provide. So like I mentioned, like serverless architecture is like so much hype, right? Like if you go to Hacker News, it's always going to be mentioned. Uh, definitely going to be mentioned on Twitter and Lobster. There's also like a lot of conferences around it as well now. Um, there's actually more than the ones I mentioned here, like this serverless comp, but there's actually a lot, a lot of conferences based around it. There's also a lot of libraries and frameworks though as well. Um, the serverless framework, which is what I'm going to be covering today, there's also Chalice and Zappa, Apex, there's also one called Kubeless, which is basically serverless for Kubernetes. So if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, Kubeless like provisions functions to be executed within a Kubernetes cluster. There's also something that's called AWS Flourish, which is kind of like, is anybody here familiar with what Swagger is? Uh, Swagger is basically, you have an API and it publishes a definition, and then applications that can use Swagger, you just point them at that definition, it's kind of like a uh, soap whistle almost. And it generates all the API endpoints and they make calls to it. But Swagger is kind of like it's starting to become something kind of like that, but for Lambda API Gateway, I meaning you can give this definition and it just like generates all the steps for you. So, like I said earlier, there's backend as a service and functions as a service. And functions as a service is pretty much just straight up, you just have a function, it's just a custom code, and it runs uh, like in. Uh, non-persistent container. And so a little bit of background for me on this is in 2013 at Zapier, Docker had just came out and we didn't have this uh, functionality because when we execute APIs, we provide our uh, people who integrate on Zapier the capability to find JavaScript functions to execute before and after um, a request. So for example, if they have an API that returns XML, we're not going to parse that XML for them. So what they have to do is they have to write like a custom JavaScript function. It takes the response, calls XML.parse, that gets out, pretty up to a decent structure, like an array of objects, and then returns it. Um, so how to do that in a way that's reasonable? It's not just running a val inside of like a server somewhere. And that's when Docker first came out. So what we did was we uh, provisioned a fleet of servers running about 50 Docker containers each. And they all basically had like a simple um, inclusion. So what happens is like a request would come in, and it would have the code, and then it would basically just write it to a file and then include it and then execute it, and then the Docker container would self-destruct. And so it's our early uh, foray into serverless. And 
that was very difficult to maintain. I think uh, one thing we discovered there is obviously that was like more than just, hey, let's run this code. That was like becoming a platform. And Lambda came out, and it's like, well, that's exactly what we wanted. And so as Lambda does is it'll just execute functions. You just define a function, you upload it, and um, it runs. And there's like no actual physical server it's running on. It's running within containers under the hood. And um, they're non-persistent. So like they might stick around for a while if you do some like deep debugging and expiration. You might discover all oh, the same containers are running every so often, but after a while they get recycled and you have fresh containers. Uh, they're also very tightly coupled to the provider's infrastructure components. So this gets back to like AWS and uh, Google Cloud differences. Like AWS has the ability to respond to events. So you can invoke a function directly, and then you can also respond to events like a new object just got added to an S3 bucket. Or um, an SQS queue has a new message published to it, it can like receive that within a Lambda function. And it provides a really good easy integration point. Like for example, back to like the whole S3 uh, bit, we, uh, we had a situation where every single time a new uh, upload, backup got uploaded to S3, we wanted to get a notification of it. And so it was like a five minute chore, just like writing a simple Node.js function that said, you know, on event, uh, send a message to the Slack channel. And then that was it. And then just like provision it, and then whenever new objects like showed up in S3 bucket, we just like get automatic notifications. So it makes it really easy to integrate. And then back on Google Cloud, so like one thing I noticed with this too, that shows about how tightly coupled it currently is, is uh, AWS has the concept of scheduled functions. So you can have a function that runs like every minute, runs like once a day at 2 p.m., stuff like that. And Google Cloud doesn't directly. So that's like a fun thing. It's like in serverless, the serverless framework, there's actually an event type called crime. And I, I did that in AWS, and then when I tried to do the same thing with Google Cloud, it wouldn't work. So I'd come up with this hack of actually provisioning a CRAN service within Google Cloud, and then it just published a notification to PubSub. And then the function itself would just respond to that PubSub event. Sorry, I'm getting a little like, down to like, some random details there. But the most important thing is it provides a really easy way to like, have an integration point. Um, the also nice thing about it is you pay for what you need. So, a lot of times, like if you're using AWS, you're provisioning T2 Micro, T2 like Nano. You know, it's a really small server. You're still going to get charged for it. Um, I think around that size, you're probably going to get paid, paid 20 bucks a month. And if you're trying to launch a new server service and you're paying 20 dollars a month, that's a lot of money if you have no revenue. So the nice thing about serverless architecture is you only have to pay for like the function executions, and then basically it breaks down like all kinds of complexities like around like the duration of the function execution, how much compute it actually uses, things like that. So you just pay for what you need, and then it also very easily scales, because um, you can easily just like scale out and say, oh, just like, have it like just expand dynamically. Like in Heroku, you have to like specify the number of dynos if you want to run multiple instances. Whereas in something like Lambda or Google Cloud Functions, um, you can set like a ceiling, and then it'll just automatically scale out based on like what the actual load is. You don't have to manage servers, which is a big plus. And then like finally, also like it's very easy to deploy. So just a little bit about Node.js. I'm not gonna go into too much. It's just like a refresher for people who haven't used Node.js. But uh, it's a JavaScript function, it runs on top of the V8 engine. Yeah, it's not very it's not exclusive, but it's pervasive, meaning that AWS Lambda, Azure functions, Google Cloud functions, Iron IO, I think even Firebase, all support Node.js. Um, AWS Lambda does have support for Python as well. And then if you want to go a bit further, um, you can trick AWS Lambda into using other languages. So like for example, you can create like uh, customized like containers to run and have like Golang running through it or Java running through it. But I haven't tried it, so I'm not saying to go try that. Um, but Node.js, like what's really cool about it is it's very event driven and I'm blocking. <laughs> So it makes it really easy for doing stuff with like, you know, where you want to respond to events because you can do like all that asynchronous processing. Um, however, like until you actually send the output out to like whatever the response is, you're going to get charged for a lot of time that it takes. Uh, it's very scripted and dynamic. It has a REPL so you can try things out. And there's lots of existing libraries and tooling out there. 
It's like with Node.js, you could just do an npm install, a bunch of packages, and then you deploy it, and then bam, you just got like all those libraries out there inside, available inside that function. And that's just a little bit about that. So AWS Lambda, go ahead. Yeah, Lambda directly supports Java and C Sharp now. Sorry? Mm. Lambda dir directly supports Java and C Sharp now. Yep, that's right, Java and C Sharp. Which is perfect if you're a Java shop or a C Sharp shop. Oh, a C Sharp shop. <laughs> you can just write functions with that. Um, but yeah, AWS Lambda, like I mentioned, all these things are right. It's more flexible than a platform as a service like Heroku. Because if you're familiar with that, you're deploying like a full project and you're having to deal with like, you know, constraints around dynos, things like that. Whereas like you're just defining the code, that's it. Um, you also get, the nice thing about AWS Lambda is you get access to all of like what Amazon provides, like this entire like ecosphere. So you get like all the things like DynamoDB for database access, Kinesis, uh, API Gateway, all that good stuff. And so like what's nice here is like your functions are very stateless, but you can like, leverage things like DynamoDB, like CloudWatch, S3 to persist data between function executions as well. So it kind of changes how you think about a program if you want to like write like a very sophisticated setup. You can actually have multiple functions that execute in response to each other. And then also like do things like this function executes from S3, insert some data in DynamoDB, and then you have a function that executes maybe 3 p.m. every day. Go get all that data out of uh, DynamoDB, process it, maybe ship it somewhere on like some kind of like API or something like that. So AWS Lambda has like some really good configuration tools. Uh, if you want to try it out, it has a free tier, and you can just go straight to the AWS console and uh, just start it. Like just write some code. You can actually just click create function, and then there's a text editor, and you can say, okay, I'm going to copy and paste this function into it, and then you save it and execute it, and it'll just work. You can also do the same thing with the AWS CLI, AWS SDK. And why I spent a lot of time talking about AWS in this, unfortunately. Um, I also recommend checking out Google Cloud, because Google Cloud uh, has a free tier now, and when you first sign up for it, you get a $300 uh, credit that you can use, which is a lot of money to burn through. Like, I haven't even burned through the first dollar yet. but. Um, I definitely recommend trying it out because the nice thing too is like even though it requires a credit card for identification verification, it won't actually charge you at all once you use up your free tier. Which one second. Which is nice because I, I think AWS on the other hand will charge you if you burn through a free tier. Um, no, no, I think like it, it won't charge you either. But yeah, I just recommend trying Google Cloud out as well, which is what I'll demo today. Um, you also get a lot of configuration options. Same thing with Google Cloud. You can specify like the runtime support, like what like languages you want to use. You can also specify the amount of memory your functions can use. So you can get like an upper limit, and say, hey, I only use 128 megabytes. And then if you go over that, the function just fails, doesn't execute. Um, you can also like specify timeouts and retries as well. And then also have a variety of different triggers. And like I mentioned, you can use inline, the inline code editor or the S3 zip <laughs> strategy, which is kind of currently what we use at Zapier, unfortunately. Um, I've been wanting to move us towards the serverless framework, but it's going to take a lot of work. But typically, what you do is uh, if your code doesn't have any dependencies or anything, you could just put a, put a snippet of code in Lambda and it'll just run. However, if you want to say use the request library, or you want to use a bunch of custom NPM modules, then what you need to do is you need to run a Docker container running CentOS 5 or something like that, CentOS 7, uh, whatever the latest CentOS version is, and do an NPM install of your project inside there, and then uh, then you like like put all of it inside a zip file, and then you ship up to S3, and then the S3 bucket uh, Lambda could just read from the S3 bucket to redeploy your app. There's a size limit on that upload. Have you had to find ways around that yet? Sorry? There's a oh, there's a limit to the size of the S3 zip you can uh, Yeah, there's a limit to the size of the, of the binary. I, mean, I, I don't quite remember what it is, though. Um, it must be pretty high because our zip file is at least uh, 121 megabytes. Wow. Oh, no, 250 megabytes. So. I think 250 is the 
So it's with all the dependencies. Yeah. Span too, but there's actually, I think, even after you zip it, I think there's, yeah. a, there's a, so even before that, there's a limit. So have you come across that and had to get around it? This yeah. Way I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some kind of limit there, but I'm not exactly positive. I could probably look that up really, really quick. Oh, well, you want to do all that? One second. <laughs> There you go, AWS Lambda limits. Oh, it's 50 megabytes. That's the default. So that's the default limit. So like with everything, oh, here you go. So I have code dependencies. You can zip and deployment package is 250 megabytes. Okay, so that's right. And the other thing with uh, Amazon is if you do go over the limits, you can always write in support and say, hey, can you all bump my limits up? And if you're a paying customer, they'll say yes. So that's the good thing. Um, you can also have like a lot of qualifiers as well. Like you can have versions, you can have like aliases for like production, stage, development. And these are nice because like sometimes when we like did deployments for our Lambda functions, uh, we made a mistake, so we had to roll back immediately. And so like it has like the the Kate Blade had versioning, and so you can easily roll back those changes immediately. And then you can also roll them out slowly versus like all at once. Which has been pretty nice. Uh, invocation, uh, you can use the AWS Web Console. You can use an event from a trigger source, or you can use the API gateway endpoints. Which, uh, for those of you who may have been here like at least two years ago, I think Brian Dolan gave a demonstration on using the API endpoints with AWS Lambda to have pretty much like a completely serverless uh, web service. He was actually using getting like paid money for it was like some kind of click tracking service that was like trace clicks with APIs. But there has been some gotchas. Uh, debugging can be really hard uh, because you can't really replicate that environment locally. You can run inside of Docker containers, but sometimes you're just gonna have to go out there, put a bunch of console logs in, and just like dig through the stack trace, figure out what's going on. Um, Logging can go to CloudWatch, then you can also monitor it as well. So, uh, AWS Lambda, like working with it directly, is like it, it requires a little bit of work. Um, sometimes you have to, uh, like I mentioned, there's like a lot of debugging problems. You have to like come up with your own build strategy. Go ahead. They've they've added a new debugging tool called X-Ray. Sorry. They've added a new debugging tool called X-Ray. Okay. To help you. So that's probably a lot better. There. I'm starting to become old now because like I haven't like invested in all these tools. Um, so that, that makes it a lot easier. Also, what I'm going to demonstrate today too is uh, when I demonstrate Google Cloud, it has like error tracing built in. It makes it pretty easy. In fact, we'll see. At my live demo, I decided to be bold. I added like a new feature to it, and we might have to do some interactive debugging. But anyway, uh, Google Cloud Framework, Azure Functions. Um, AWS Lambda, all of those have like differences between them and interacting with them is different. However, there's a serverless framework that came out recently. So when people say, hey, serverless is all the rage, they're not just talking about Lambda and stuff, they're also talking about this actual framework called serverless, um, which took me a while to discover. Like, I didn't know this until at least three or four months ago that serverless is an actual framework. And the nice thing is, is it's a command line tool that um, kind of provides a nice abstraction over all these different type of providers and um, makes it really easy to just build um, function-based applications to regardless of which point your provider is. It's also very, very quick to set up and run with too. So why it's really important to like pay attention to serverless, and this is actually data, it's been at 1.0 for a while, uh, but they got $3 million in seed funding, which is pretty good. Uh, the source is open sourced, so you can like look over everything within their open source project for it. It supports Node.js, Python, Java, C Sharp, and others. And then this this is again data, but AWS, Google Cloud, and uh, Azure Functions are all supported. And it helps really organize and manage a serverless project. You can get started really, really quickly. Um, it does the whole creation, configuration, deployment for you. And um, on AWS specifically, it does all the resource management via cloud formation stacks. But then, like, Google Cloud, it pretty much does everything just within Google Cloud itself. 
and then it also gives you a good way to structure your project to actually have it based around services. So around services, basically a service is the frameworks unit of organization like a project. So it defines functions along with the events and resources that they use. And um, you know what, let's just go ahead and jump into a demo really quick. But well, I'll go ahead and just do this real quick and then I'll actually show an actual live demo. But here's, here's an example of being started. So you just do an npm install uh, dash g serverless. And then you just run serverless create and give it a template. And then the path where you want it to go to, or you could, yeah, the path would be like your project name. So in this case, it'll be foot. And um, the nice thing about this is uh, you have to go through the walkthrough and it'll tell you like what you need to set up as far as your API keys, your uh, Google Cloud configuration, stuff like that. But once that's set up, you just go into it, and then um, if it'll just you just like serverless deploy, and it'll just deploy it. And then you can also deploy a specific function. You can invoke a specific function, and you can even provide a parameter to give it like an event to debug things. So that way you can actually say, oh, what would an SQS uh, event look like? And you can go look on Amazon, like for example, like if you just go to uh, say, hey, what does an AWS SQS notification event JSON? I mean, I'm pretty sure you can just be able to go out here and find an example. And you just go and grab that, dump it into a JSON file, and then like use that to experiment and see how it uh, how it will actually look. How the function will actually behave, because you're able to invoke it directly. And then you can also use serverless logs to be able to retrieve the logs, whether it's CloudWatch logs or Google Cloud logs, and you can see like what the actual um, what you've actually got. I'll save that for later, because I'm pretty sure we're going to have some interactive debugging when I do my live demo. And then there's also the configuration, which I'm going to show you mine in a little bit. This, this is just a dummy example. But for AWS, you can have like, your service name and then the provider that you're using, and you can specify like, all the attributes related to it. Now, if you leave them out, you'll just get whatever the defaults are, so you don't have to plug all these in. And you can also get things like IAM role capabilities if you're on AWS. Uh, same thing, we'll go to cloud. And then um, you can also specify like your functions and like, you know, kind of like where the events are coming from, what kind of handlers to use, as well as like a lot of different resources that you might be wanting to provision as well. And for, uh, for AWS, this will actually go out there and provision AWS Dynamo, DB table, given the table name, the attributes. So, what I'm going to do now is do a quick demo and we'll see how this goes. So um, just, just to start though, I'm not going to do, do this all from scratch, but if I did create and if I wanted to do, is that visible? Yeah. Okay, I think that's visible for everybody. Okay. Let me clear it. Oh. So let me put this down here before I end up creating a disaster. But if I wanted to create something, uh, I'll just say new project. And if I just said error, I'll just go ahead and create like a template for uh, Google Node.js based template. So if I wanted like a Google Python, I can just do a Google Python as well. In fact, let's see what happens really quick. I guess that won't work. Anyway, it's something like that. Anyway, you can just go ahead and just do this. And so this creates just three files, and you'll have a index.json or index.js. And the default template you'll create is a HTTP template. So there actually, there's, there's actually an endpoint that you can hit, and when you go out there, it'll actually be served up on the web, and it'll actually send like a plain text response. Um, pretty straightforward. And then this, the first one is an example of an HTTP event. The second one is an example of 
uh, responding to events from within Google Cloud, whether it's a PubSub event or any of the other events that Google Cloud supports. And if we look at the serverless.yaml, this is the probably the more important piece as it tells you the service name, the provider, runtime, uh, your credentials, uh, plugins that you want to use, and then the package is basically saying like for locally these are things to ignore. So when you do serverless deploy, it's going to push everything up to the cloud. I like saying that. It's going to push up to the cloud and then I could just talk, hey, exclude things like the node modules directory, get ignore, that get. Uh, the node modules one is important because if you have node modules that are compiled C uh, libraries and you just did a npm install on like OS X and it's going to like generate some Mac based binaries and then you upload it and then it's going to try to run that in a Linux based Docker container, things are just going to blow up tremendously. Um, so explode node modules and we'll do it. If you do have a C dependency, it'll go ahead and compile that for you. And then if that C dependency actually depends on a library to be installed, that's an extra directive you can actually include. They'll all install that library. And then down here it just has like the function it's going to call, which is it gives it the name. So first is just a name. You can re you can rename that to anything. But what it's actually calling is the handler, which we, as we saw earlier, it's just this uh, HTTP right here. So these can be just called handler, and those, those are just like root functions that are available there. So if I want to make this event, I can just put an event in there and then define like which event that I want to respond to. So there's a, there's a second step in here though that I don't want to do because it would take forever if I actually did it. And that is going into Google Cloud and actually setting up the project. Uh, which is actually pretty easy though. There's a how-to guide if you go out to serverless. It'll show you a quick start. And it'll tell you exactly what you need to do as far as like going out there and like setting things up. Uh, and like all of like setting up your credentials, setting up your services out there, things like that. I'm not going to do that live though. Uh, what I am going to do though is just go and show my dashboard here real quick. One second. First, let me go back a few steps. Okay. And so, what I did, I, I made a small change to this, just for fun. Um, to actually send a HTTP request to hooks.zapier.com, step is that it's actually going to uh, receive some data from it when I invoke it and then see if that actually works. But basically what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to set up, I set up a Zap on Zapier, which is uh, the product for the company I work for. And it allows you to catch a webhook. So you can catch a webhook and do things in response to a webhook. And so, let's see if they can get that to work. So all it's going to do is it's send a, re a request to Zapier, and it's going to send a JSON payload with like an array of numbers. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Zap that uses a uh, you can have custom functions run inside of it to like compute the sum and then like send it to Slack or something like that. So for let's deploy. So what you run if you actually want to deploy a, a package out to. Google Cloud in this case. We still do like all this like compiling things, uploading artifacts, and then updating the deployment, which I do update progress. And so if you have like a um, compilation error, say you've got a comma, or you've got, you uh, have a, a syntax error in your code, this will just bottom out during the deployment phase. So you don't have to do the old school ways where you deploy something and then you find out after the fact that it blew up. And then, let's see here. And so this basically also shows like the API request and then your billing, estimated charges, and then they also have like error reporting down here as well, which is pretty nice. 
So it's done, so let's see what happens. Can we invoke it? Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. <laughs> okay, so I'm probably going to remove that though. Let's see if we, if, if we want to do this for now. Because I'm not going to do a huge or active debugging session here. Okay, so I'm just going to deploy that again. Now I'll go out there, and then while that's going out there, I'll see if I can see what the error was for that. These are older. The, the only thing that kind of stinks about this is it can take about a minute, two minutes for errors to actually show up. So I can make it a little harder to debug. I think if you use like the logs function within here, I'll get it. Okay, and you'll see that this also gives you an endpoint now. So, if we go out to it. The first time will always be a little slow because it's provisioning the container. You can see, oh, got a hello dev combo. And then also if you want to invoke it locally, you can invoke it as well. And then I'll give you the output. Uh, so like a little tag, this with the function execution reference ID. We can use that for like debugging purposes. So give me one minute. Let's see if we can debug this. Because I want to see this work. <laughs> We'll give it uh, two, not about three minutes. It's 29 after, so if like 32 after I've got work here, I say, hey, that's good enough. This is wrap up the presentation. So I'm going to leave this status right here is what I was complaining about. One second. Let's go get this logs command from right here. So wait for it to upload. And also say get logs for first. Well, that's what I should have done. Is this this whole where you cannot read property status have been defined? So, let's make sure. Oh. Okay, I think it should be good. Let's see if this works now. So, if we invoke it, because you see it's function executed started down here. Okay, so this time it works. So, if we go to Zapier now, and say, okay, I did this, and it's going to wait for a webhook to come in. And so while that's waiting, let's just go ahead and invoke this again. And if everything's successful, it should say, got it. You know what, let's do one thing here. Because I don't think it's actually saying that. Uh, let's see. So I think I might have like just forgot to save it when that came through.
Okay. So I think Vodka. Okay, so we know we got our update code because it's in two of them. And we know that it's in it in the response here. So one thing I'm just going to do too is just console log error. Console log response. And then let's just see if we got anything yet. So this is all they didn't get anything. So one last time. I don't want to see this for. I think this is good because this also shows you a debugging cycle when you're working with like functions and serverless. But in a normal situation, you know, like typically like when you work with serverless, typically when you use like um, I have functions like they're either isolated, serving a very specific purpose, or sometimes we might chain them as well. Um, the biggest thing we've been using it for is Zapier, is besides the actual code execution that we do. We've also been using it for like a lot of uh, infrastructure type work. Like things in the past where I like had to put Python scripts out on a server somewhere and have them run in from cron. We just now just use like Lambda functions for. Alright, so one last time. And then we'll just call it quits. So I'm okay. Let's see the logs. Well, I guess we'll just have to call it. Start. I will get that working though, and like show that on the side afterwards. Um, anyway, back to uh, all together. So the bat, it's been evolving very quickly. Um, so it may not pay well with some other infrastructure tools. It's also, serverless is still pretty new. Uh, it needs a little bit of maturity. For the most part, AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions are pretty solid. Um, however, like Azure Functions, when I tried it, it was very rough because we had like a nice like ten thousand dollar credit on Azure function Azure. So I wanted to try that out, and it was like still pretty rough there. Um, currently, it doesn't really play well with a lot of other infrastructure tools. So if you want to use Serverless and then also use Terraform in a way where it's managing some of your uh, Lambda functions, there could be like some conflict there. And that's it, so any questions? All right. Thanks for having me. And then, uh, like I said, if I, I'll try to get that demo working and then show like, a, a video of it on the Meetup page so I can see it actually working in the real world. Because one thing I wanted to show is Zapier is kind of serverless too, in the sense that you could have like a webhook, and then you can write custom code in response to that webhook. And then, like, attach another API on it that goes and does something else. But uh, that was like my advertisement for our product. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank you.